Across a variety of sports, football, tennis, rugby union, cricket, American football, and probably some sports I don't even know about, we are seeing sportsmen and women staying on the pinnacle of their chosen sport for longer and longer. Are we in the age of the ageless sportsman? Welcome to The Luke Alfred Show. I have 30 years of experience on the front lines of sports journalism, covering some of the biggest games in cricket, rugby, the FIFA World Cup, and even the Olympic Games. Come and join me as we learn about some of the greatest sports stories you've never heard. I'm Luke Alfred, and welcome to the show. The place was Perth, Western Australia. The date, December 13, 1974, the occasion the second Ashes test between Australia and England. England were in a spot of bother. They had lost the first test in Brisbane by 166 runs. Not only had they lost the series opener, but they had also lost frontline batters, Dennis Amos and John Edrich, to injury. The selectors, chaired by Alec Betzer, were in a quandary. Batting stocks were running low. What were they going to do? The most obvious way to solve the problem was to convince Jeff Boycott, who had made himself unavailable, to put his differences with England captain Mike Dennis aside and jump on a plane. But Boycott was an opener. For him, moral matters were a form of trench warfare. He dug in. There was no moral maze for Jeff. It was the simple world, the child's world of right and wrong. Next, Betzer thought of Colin Cowdery who he'd mildly considered to tour in the first place before moving on to more spry candidates like Barry Wood and Frank Hayes. He consulted with the England skipper out in Australia, Dennis. On the last day of the first test in Brisbane, Dennis phoned Cowdery at his home in Kent. Cowdery had just been watching highlights of the first test on television. After a lob or two of pleasantries, just so Cowdery could get his eye in, Dennis popped the question. Why don't you fly out to join us, Colin? I'd love to, came the reply. It's nice to be remembered. Cowdery was English cricket. His initials, Michael Colin Cowdery, were those of the MCC. In thinking about him, it's impossible not to call to mind Neville Cardus's famous essay on W.G. Grace. Grace, said Cardus, quote, was institutional, People regarded him and discussed him just as they regarded and discussed Mr. Gladstone and the national debt. It did not matter at all whether or not you yourself were interested in cricket. You came under a social obligation to say something about him at dinner. Having been phoned by Dennis, Cowdery boarded a flight out of Heathrow for Australia a couple of days later. But the plane developed engine trouble and had to land unexpectedly in what was then called Bombay. After a mammoth 47-hour flight, according to Crick Info's Martin Williamson, Cowdery arrived in Australia. He met a pack of pressmen curious to know why he'd bothered. His test career had started in Brisbane in 1954, and this would be his sixth Ashes visit. It was winter in England. Shouldn't he be putting his feet up? with eggnog, by the fire. Cowdery's answer became clear in the days to follow. On the first morning of the second test, England batted. When Brian Luckhurst was out for 27 with a total on 44, Cowdery, always slightly on the stout side, padded to the wicket after clapping Luckhurst off by moving a gloved hand to his partially raised bat in a gesture of patrician noblesse that you suspect was almost second nature. Having taken ten or so further steps to the wicket, Cowdery raised his bat fully to the ovation on the stands. He took guard and introduced himself to the Australian fast bowler, Jeff Thompson, who, with Dennis Lilly, terrorised England in the first test. Between them, the two had taken 13 wickets. I don't believe we've met, Cowdery said to Jeff. The name's Colin Cowdery. Jeff was hairy. He rejoiced in giving the impression that doing up your shirt buttons was an optional extra. He was unorthodox, with a slingshot action, having made his debut against Pakistan at the MCG in late 1972. On the eve of his second test in Brisbane two years later, Lily found Thompson nursing a scotch in the hotel bar. Quote, I bowl best with a headache, 
Thompson is reputed to have confided, although Jeff wasn't really the confiding type. Let's just say he growled instead. It's more Jeff, more Tomo, as he was sometimes called. If Cowdery's introduction to Thompson has the faint air of an Ian Fleming novel about it, don't be fooled. The really important thing to know was that Cowdery was 41 when Dennis and Betzer pushed him willingly into service against Lily, Thompson and Max Walker, that bear-like, friendly, almost perfect, loose-limbed Australian. Cowdery had bothered because Dennis had remembered. Dennis had given him a call. He'd bothered because he had captained England 27 times and was a national institution. He bothered because England asked and service was hardwired into Cowdery's genes. When you asked, Cowdery responded. That's simply how it was. The story is told that Cowdery came prepared for Lillian Thompson's assault. Tony Gregg, yet to become England's skipper, watched Cowdery unlatched his equipment-carrying suitcase in the Perth nets before the test and noticed that it literally sprung open. This was because it was filled with foam rubber. This foam was going to be used for protection, particularly of the chest. Remember, these were helmetless days in cricket. Cowdery, let's not forget, was 41, no longer quite as quick of hand and eye as he once was. He needed all the soft armour he could get. It's amazing to think that Jimmy Anderson, who turns 41 on July 30, slap bang in the middle of the ashes, will be the same age as Cowdery was when he was dragooned into action by Dnes and Bedsa. How things stay the same. How things change. Back in 1974, Cowdery kept fit playing squash. Anderson's regime has slightly more prongs to its fitness bow. He's a great fan of the 23-7, for example. 50-meter sprints he aims to complete in under 7 seconds, with 23 seconds of recovery time spent jogging between the next 50-meter sprint. All in all, he does 10 of those before resting thoroughly. Anderson also has what has been described as a modest home gym, complete with an exercise bicycle, weights and a medicine ball. One of his famous exercises involves sitting on the floor with his legs in the air as he holds the medicine ball in both hands, rotating across his midriff from right to left and back again. This, he says, keeps his core and back strong. A fast bowler's back is his best friend. Treat it well, he advises. It's onerous, of course, to compare Cowdery and Anderson, both members of the esteemed 41 club. But Anderson is a natural athlete in the way that MCC never was. His famous 15-pace run to the crease is a model of balance and economy designed to be at its most effective just as he's approaching the crease. No surprises there, really. Rhythm is everything to Anderson, so he practices his run-up and surge through the crease. When he's happy, he does exactly the same thing with a ball in his hand. That ball is artfully disguised, as it sits like a juicy plum in Anderson's hand. The batsman doesn't know whether he's being bowled an away swinger or an inducker until a fraction of a second before he needs to commit himself to the shot. All but the best can be all over the place. The squash playing Cowdery presented more of a target, a target that figuratively speaking, appeared to get larger as the 1974-5 Ashes progressed. Writing from the press box during the first test, Keith Miller, the ex-Australian all-rounder, said that Thompson had frightened him even from afar. And, to quote Miller, I was sitting 200 yards away. Cowdery appeared to take all the macho spit and snarl in his good-natured stride, a stride doubtless slowed down ever so slightly by all that foam rubber. At one point he even said that facing Lily, Thompson and Walker was, quote, fun, although his effectiveness declined as the series progressed, so you wonder if the fun finally ran a trifle thin. His final test was the sixth, an England victory by an innings, their only victory in a series they lost 4-1. England only batted once in the sixth, Cowdery scoring seven. From afar it only looks sad. 
Is an average of 18 across the six tests really worth leaving the comforts of the Sunday roast and the gas-lit fire for? Cowdery isn't with us to answer the question himself, but from what we already know, I rather fancy that the answer would be yes. Fun is not an adjective you associate with the long-suffering Anderson, to whom the five-day game can appear to be a grind. Then again, it's right and proper to remind ourselves that Anderson has been doing this for 20 years, which is enough to make even the sunniest of us a tad tetchy. After all, would you want to bowl on the fourth afternoon at the MCG with David Warner humming on a runner ball 64 not out and the Aussies with a lead of 270? No, sir, I don't think you would. Anderson made his test debut against Zimbabwe at Lords in May 2003, taking 5 for 73 and 0 for 65 in a comprehensive England victory. He's played 179 tests since, taking 685 test wickets, bowling, wait for it, 38,293 deliveries. The mind boggles. That's a hell of a lot of work in the modest home gym with the medicine ball. No wonder he sometimes appears snarly. Cowdery was the heroic lone figure, marching to the sound of distant bugles in England's hour of need, while Anderson is not alone in this age of the ageless sportsman and woman. The list is long and getting longer, as tennis players Rafael Nadal and Serena Williams Footballers Cristiano Ronaldo, Luka Modric and Thiago Silva and the Irish fly half Johnny Sexton all keep on keeping on, all heading towards 40 with a breeze in their sails. Just last week, another addition to the growing pantheon, someone we might have forgotten had he simply stayed in his AC Milan shirt and declined to be interviewed. When Sweden played Belgium in Solna in a Euro qualifier on Friday night, there was one Zlatan Ibrahimovic in their midst, recovered from a knee injury and at a sprightly 41, as full of bombast as a hot air balloon. In interview during camp, Zlatan was his usually shy, self-effacing self, telling the world's cameras that he was the, quote, past, present and future of Swedish football. I wonder how your teammates feel about that, Zlatan. Earlier in the interview, he said that at his age it was advisable to live in the present, which seems sensible enough, but the two quotes don't really square, do they? If he's living fully in the present, he's not supposed to have any designs on being the future of Swedish football, now is he? And he's not supposed to be looking back too far into the Swedish football past either, no doubt looking for his rightful place, in that past as he goes. Thank goodness Latan's good at heading a football, wearing his hair long and taking penalties, because clearly chronology isn't his thing. Maybe he's not content to think of himself simply as the future, and wants to have those other two bases, the present and the past, covered too. What day was yesterday again, Latan? Was yesterday the day before tomorrow, or the day before today? Yesterday is an interesting proposition in Sexton's case because with that wiry frame and thin white legs, there seems to be a shade of yesteryear about him. It's illusory, of course, because Johnny's as hard as boot studs, the hammer to all those willing Irish nails. As with the other ageing sportsmen in the pantheon of the ageless, what's beautiful about Johnny, as it is with Jimmy, is the quality of mind. These guys have seen it all before. They don't make mistakes and know what to do and when to do it. They've pared the game down to its absolute basics. Watching them play their chosen sport is like watching them eat poached trout at their favourite swanky restaurant. All you see afterwards are the bare bones of the game. About six or seven years after Jimmy started playing for England, he chucked away the so-called magic ball. The magic ball was seductive, the Harry Potter ball everyone wanted to bowl, the highlights package ball, the ball to rival Shane Warne's ball of the century. Instead he went for a grouping of balls, believing that with a good grouping balls would become maidens and maidens would eventually become wickets. Dot, 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 dot. Bowling was a form of Morse code, with the end of the over being signalled by a dash. You can see Anderson's logic because I imagine striving for the magic ball brings its own perils, 
its own self-imposed weight of expectation. Jettisoning the search for the magic ball, cricket's holy grail, wasn't only a form of growing up, it was a form of prolonging his career. Sexton plays a different sport, but he's essentially the same dot 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 man rather than a magic play man. He plays the percentages and he plays them exceptionally well. He'll be 38 come the World Cup later this year in France, and talk is that with him there, the Grand Slam and Six Nations winners have as good a shot at World Cup victory as they've ever had. Speaking on New Zealand television the other night, John Kerwin, the ex-All Black, said that he thought Ireland and France have now gone beyond the Southern Hemisphere's big three. The Irish forwards make one groggy just looking at them. Their backline inventiveness needs to be watched three or four times before the plays are properly understood. As far as the Irish are concerned, Sexton's a huge part of this. Keep those knees in cotton wool, Johnny. Keep those hands in cotton wool, too. The question to be asked about Sexton, Anderson, Ibrahimovic, Williams, Nadal and Modric et al. is how have they managed to be young for so long? What's their secret? Is it simply staying out of trouble? Jimmy flirted with vegetarianism, but the wife didn't fancy it, so that's not the answer to his longevity. The ice bath certainly has something to do with it, and better conditioning, and keeping the intake of juice confined to what goes in the blender. Recovery rituals and exercises must also play their part, so too must advances in medical science. MCC was helped by foam rubber. That looks a tad old hat today. In this regard, I asked Professor John Patricius of Witz Sport and Health in Johannesburg what he thought about the prevailing cult of longevity. He answered as follows, quote, When it comes to well-being and longevity, both intrinsic, inherent to your own makeup, and extrinsic, outside the body, factors play their part. Genetics plays a large role in determining physique, muscle type and biomechanics, but so does risk-taking, which is part of one's psychological disposition. Extrinsically, training, both the correct type and load management, are critical. Equipment, including footwear, is an important external factor, and so are medicine, drugs and access to care. The greatest risk for injury is previous injury, particularly if not managed appropriately. Finally, of course, there's plain old luck. This, I think you'll agree, is a very good answer, with two aspects that warrant further discussion. A truism, yes, but according to Patricius, injuries not properly healed lead to other injuries, which speaks to the quality of care international sportsmen and women have around them nowadays. And then there's that hoary old chestnut, luck. Nadal and Anderson have all had their injuries, but as a generalization, Many of the ageless have recovered from injury well. Have they been lucky, or is luck simply the name we give to that tangled web of tricky variables we find it too difficult to unravel? The current cult of the ageless sportsman and woman certainly gives the impression that they're the beneficiaries of their own self-fulfilling prophecy. They've always wanted to play their sport for a long time, so they've played their chosen sport for a long time. Another phrase for self-fulfilling prophecy is the interpersonal expectancy effect, which tells us something interesting about the collective dimension of the self-fulfilling prophecy. Might more and more sportsmen and women be becoming aware that there are others out there like them? As they become aware that there are others like them out there, so others become aware that there are others like them, and others become aware that there are others like them. Soon the average age of your average World Cup winning side will be in the low 40s, like Ibrahimovic, like Modric, like Ronaldo and Thiago Silva, and Portugal's Pepe, one we haven't mentioned before. One of the pitfalls of playing top-class international sport forever is that beyond a certain indefinable point, not retiring can make it more and more difficult to retire. The longer you go on, the longer you want to go on, and the longer you want to go on makes the horror of retirement well, all that more horrible. Think of this little emotional and professional teaser as the Brady conundrum, named, of course, after Tampa Bay Buccaneers quarterback Tom Brady, 
who first announced his retirement in February 2022 before coming out of the netherworld of retirement 40 days later. The problem with coming out of retirement is that it simply delays the inevitable, and the inevitable will not be delayed. Or not forever. This is as true for Brady as it is for other mortals, and finally, Brady retired a couple of months ago, aged 45. He'll be in the commentary box for Fox Sport from now on, earning his exorbitant salary, conferring his analytical smarts, and bathing everyone close in his all-round radiance. He'll also be wondering from time to time why he ever came out of retirement. He might ponder over this little chestnut for quite a while, possibly even as long as his playing days lasted, minus the retirement, of course. Then again, he might ponder upon this big question for significantly less time than we think. Why? Because he's simply come out of retirement. Again. One man who has never given the impression of being bothered by any of this is Kazu Yoshimura, the Japanese footballer known as Kazu for short. Kazu, or King Kazu, currently plays his football in the Portuguese second division. The spirits of this Japanese footballing institution show no signs of flagging, which is just as well if he's playing professionally. It's also just as well when I tell you that on February 27 earlier this year, King Kazu turned 56.